Hi, y'all. You know what time it is. Ha! Get into it! Get into it! Yes! Hey, happy people. How's it going? Today has been a wonderful day. It was super busy today at work. I got to take care of a wonderful wedding party at my job today. And I got to sing for the bride and groom and show them some love because this is a special day. Whether you're gay, straight, bisexual, pansexual, wherever you are on the spectrum, love is love. And it should be celebrated with ceremony and grand gesture. And it should be done so with exuberance and just just love i just i love seeing it doesn't matter i love seeing people get together and make a commitment and just be happy it's a good thing as i told somebody the other day kindness and compassion should never be a foreign concept it was a busy day today thankfully i work with an awesome team of people that look out for me shout out to jeremiah shout out to jen shout out to all my cooks and chefs that work with me Shout out to Annie, Matt, Julio, Eugene. Thank you all so, so, so much. Because we would not have gotten through today without you all's help. Um, and also, I had another inch. I just love my job. Like, I don't, I don't know if I talk about my full-time job. Like, I work at Ellie's Restaurant and Bakery here in Yellow Springs. Um, I love what I do for people because I wait tables i host i bartend I'm, I'm a barista and i also sing for wedding anniversaries and birthdays and on request when i have time um <clears throat> i wish i could sing all day long but i have guests to take care of and helping out with side work and helping out with my friends and those are important and those take priority i have to make sure that i'm doing my job right before i can take some time to entertain and this week i had a wonderful family who is local, uh, but no longer live. Well, they are from town, but they no longer live in town. Whose um, matriarchal figure, um, the woman who I was more so close with um, and met her daughters, um, her mother passed away last night. Um, as she had been in hospice uh, these past few weeks. And the family was able to gather everybody together um, in enough time for everybody to say their final farewells and I came in to work I saw her I said hey good morning how's it going and she was dressed in this beautiful floral print dress very bright green and pink and just giving all types of summer vibes she said yes um mom passed away last night and so I'm wearing um something bright and colorful to celebrate her life and I'm gonna okay I am an empath through and through. I am a very empathic person. When I heard that, that, that hurt me. Like, that really, I felt her grief. And the fact that she was able to come downstairs, hold herself up with calm and elegance and grace really spoke to me. As someone who has myself gone through numerous numerous moments with grief with losing people um, losing loved ones lovers friends even that stuff is not easy it, it is not easy as somebody who is diagnosed with severe depression and anxiety naming moi um it's not easy to go through that and I've always had this policy. I'm not going to cry right now. Hold on. Because <laughs> I've cried enough today. Because I felt, I felt so bad. I felt so bad. Because that's like. That's your mom. Like. That's your mother. That's the person that brought you. Literally brought you into this world. And showed you. Nature. And elegance. And beauty. And appreciating one's beauty. That's a huge thing. And I. I did cry. I got myself together. I continued to do my job. And at one point, I had a bit of time. I was caught up. <clears throat> I was caught up with work. And I sat down next to her. And I said, well, you know I sang. And she was like, 
Yes, of course, I would love to hear some. And I sang Smile by Judy Garland, for those who know me in town. I sang that song at Susan Johnson's Celebration of Life ceremony last month. And whether it's the Nat King Cole version or the Judy Garland version, that song will always resonate <clears throat> with me because it is a song of hope. It is to smile even in the face of adversity and know that things will be all right. And I sang and I felt it in my spirit and everybody at that table, even in the dining room, was very much touched. And I didn't do it for grandeur. I did not do it for fun. I did it because um, it was necessary. You have to show people that there is hope, that there is goodness in the world, that there is joy in the world, and that God puts people in your life to help you understand that. And I'm glad that I was able to do that for her today. I'm really glad I was able to do that for her today because I would want somebody to do that for me and to be able to show me kindness and compassion if I was in a state of grieving and um, I'm glad I got to do that today. You never know whose lives you affect on a day-to-day -day basis. You can never know what happens behind closed doors and you should always lead with compassion and kindness and not be so presumptuous as to think that everybody's life is just hunky dory and peaches and cream because it could be it could be totally different and I'm glad I got that opportunity I'm, I'm crying tears of joy and also of sadness because, like I said, I know what grief is like. I know what it's like to lose somebody that means the world to you and to see the world in a different headspace. I know exactly what that's like. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I just had to talk about that today. I just had a really awesome day. <clears throat> For the most part, everything went really smoothly. Like I said, I work with an awesome team of people. Everybody's super cool. Everybody's really dope. And, you know, we just have to continue to look out for each other. Because, like I said, you never know what somebody is going through behind closed doors. You never know. Just got to lead with kindness. Don't do it because you would ex you expect a reward. Don't do it because you want to be recognized. Just do it because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be a good Samaritan to somebody else. Even people who treat you poorly do not. And children, please listen to me when I say this. Do not antagonize that by repeating the behavior of also being mean to them because that's not going to do nothing but eat up at you and to hurt you it's not going to do anything but hurt you and when you allow people to make you get out of character and to act poorly and to be mean-spirited they win you lose so rather than allowing people to treat you any type of way which you should never do that be better than what they expect you to be Show them that you are better than what they perceive you to be. So they can be dumbfounded like, well, nothing I do can ever phase this person. Because guess what? You are strong. You are beautiful. Oh my goodness, this is sounded like the speech from the help. Uh, you is special. You is kind. And you is important. No, because it's true. You are beautifully made, y'all. You are wonderful people who deserve all the love and kindness that God has to offer whatever form that may take <clears throat> excuse me so sorry ah okay so I skipped a page there we go 
Now, back into the land of Wonderland. And of course, I do not own the music that you are hearing in the background. Which is starting to become one of my favorite musical selections. It is Aerith's Garden. It is ambient music from Final Fantasy VII Remake. Which is honestly way better than the original. I said what I said. Said what I said. Do not come for me in the comments. Chapter 8. The Queen's Croquet Ground. A large rose tree stood near the entrance of the garden. The roses growing on it were white, but there were three gardeners at it, busily painting them red. Alice thought this a very curious thing, and she went nearer to watch them, and just as she came up to them, she heard one of them say, Look out now, Five! Don't go splashing paint over me like that! I couldn't help it, said Five in a sulky tone. Seven jogged my elbow, on which Seven looked up and said, That's right, Five! Always lay the blame on others. You better not talk, said Five. I heard the Queen say only yesterday you deserve to be beheaded. What for, said the one who had spoken first. That's none of your business, too, said Seven. Yes, it is his business, said Five. And I'll tell him it was for bringing the cook tulip roots instead of onions. Seven flung down his brush, had just begun. Well, of all the unjust things when his eyes chanced to fall upon Alice. As she stood watching them, and he checked himself subtly, the others looked round also, and all of them bowed low. Well, hopefully you can see them all busy about in this tree, which definitely reminds me of painting the roses red, painting the roses red. Oh, pardon me, oh, Mr. Three, why are you painting them red? Oh, oh, well, the queen wanted red roses, but we got white. And we will lose our heads. We're painting the roses red. Not pink, not green, not aquamarine. We're painting the roses red. <laughs> it's one of my favorite sequences from that movie. If you haven't seen, if your kids have not seen Disney's Alice in Wonderland, go watch it. It's a good time. Good time. Not the live actual with Tim Burton. That one's bit different. That is questionable. We'll talk about it another time. Would you tell me, please, said Alice, a little timidly, why are you painting those roses? Five and seven said nothing, but looked at two. Two began in a low voice. Why, the fact is, you see, miss, this here ought to have been a red rose tree, and we put a white one in by mistake. And if the queen was to find out, we should all have our heads cut off, you know. So you see, miss, we're doing our best after she comes to. At this moment, Five, who had been anxiously looking across the garden, called out, The queen! The queen! And the three gardeners instantly threw themselves flat upon their faces. There was a sound of many footsteps, and Alice looked round, eager to see the queen. First came ten soldiers carrying clubs. These were all shaped like the three gardeners oblong and flat with their heads and feet at the corners. Next, the ten courtiers. These were ornamented all over with diamonds and walked two and two and two as the soldiers did. After these came the royal children. There were ten of them and the little deers came jumping merrily along hand in hand in couples. They were all ornamented with hearts. Next came the guests, mostly kings and queens, and among them Alice recognized the white rabbit. It was talking in a hurried, nervous manner, smiling at everything that was said and went by without noticing her. Then followed the knave of hearts, carrying the king's crown on a crimson velvet cushion. And last of all, this grand procession came the king and queen of hearts. Alice was rather doubtful whether she ought not to lie down on her face like the three gardeners, but she could not remember ever having heard of such a rule at processions. And besides, what would be the use of a procession, she thought, if people had all to lie down on their faces so they couldn't see it. So she stood where she was and waited. When the procession came opposite to Alice, they all stopped and looked at her, and the queen said severely, Who is this? She said it to the knave of hearts, who only bowed and smiled in reply. Idiot! said the queen, tossing her head impatiently and turning to Alice. She went on, what is your name, child? My name is Alice, so please, your majesty, said Alice very politely, but she added to herself, Why, they're only a pack of cards. After all, I needn't be afraid of them. 
And who are these? Said the queen, pointing to the three gardeners who were lying to the round the rose tree. For you see, as they were lying on their faces and the pattern on their backs was the same as the rest of the pack, she could not tell whether they were gardeners or soldiers or courtiers or three of her own children. How should I know? said Alice, surprised at her own courage. It's no business of mine. The queen turned crimson with fury, and after glaring at her for a moment like a wild beast, began screaming, Off with the head! Off! Nonsense, said Alice, very loudly and decidedly, and the queen was silent. So this is the scene we're getting right here. The queen is just over it. She is just fury incarnate. She is not happy. The king laid his hand upon her arm and timidly said, uh, Consider, my dear, she is only a child. The queen turned angrily away from him and said to the knave, Turn them over! The knave did so very carefully with one foot. Get up! said the queen in a shrill, loud voice, and the three gardeners instantly jumped up and began bowing to the king, the queen, the royal children, and everybody else. Leave off that! screamed the queen. You make me giddy! And then turning to the rose tree, she went on, What have you been doing here? May it please your majesty, said to in a very humble tone, going down on one knee as he spoke. We were trying to... I see, said the queen, who had meanwhile been examining the roses. Off with their heads, said the procession. Moved on, three of the soldiers remained behind to execute the unfortunate gardeners, who ran to Alice for protection. You shan't be beheaded, said Alice, and she put them into a large flower pot that stood near. The three soldiers wandered about for a minute or two looking for them, and then quietly marched off after the others. Are their hands off, shouted the queen. Their heads are gone, if it please your majesty, the shoulders, soldiers shouted in reply. That's right, shouted the queen. Can you play croquet? The soldiers were silent and looked at Alice, and the question was evidently meant for her. Yes, shouted Alice. Come on, then, roared the queen, and Alice joined the procession, wondering very much what would happen next. It's a very fine day, said a timid voice at her side. She was walking by the white rabbit, who was peeping anxiously to her face. Very, said Alice. Where's the duchess? Hush, hush, said the rabbit in a low, hurried tone. He looked anxiously over his shoulder as he spoke, and then raised himself up upon tiptoe, put his mouth close to her ear, and whispered, She's under sentence of execution. What for? said Alice. Did you say, what a pity? The rabbit rabbit asked. No, I didn't, said Alice. I don't think it's at all a pity. I said, what for? She boxed the queen's ears, the rabbit began. Alice gave a little scream of laughter. Oh, hush, the rabbit whispered in a frightened tone. The queen will hear you. You see, she came rather late, and the queen said, Get to your places! shouted the queen in a voice of thunder, and people began running about in all directions, tumbling against each other. However, they got settled down in a minute or two, and the game began. Which I am going to take this moment to clean my glasses, because it's not good when one can't see. Alice thought she had never seen such a curious croquet ground in her life. It was all ridges and furrows. The croquet balls were live hedgehogs and the mallets live flamingos. And the soldiers had to double themselves up and stand on their hands and feet to make the arches. The chief difficulty Alice found at first was in managing her flamingo. She succeeded in getting its body tucked away comfortably enough under her arm, with its legs hanging down, but generally, just as she had got its neck nicely straightened out and was going to give the hedgehog a blow with its head, it would twist itself round and look up into her face with such a puzzled expression that she could not help bursting out laughing. 
And when she had got its head down and was going to begin again, it was very provoking to find that the hedgehog had unrolled itself and was in the act of crawling away. Besides all this, there was generally a ridge or a furrow in the way wherever she wanted to send the hedgehog to, and as the doubled up soldiers were always getting up and walking off to other parts of the ground, Alice soon came to the conclusion that it was a very difficult game indeed. Alice is just very, very perplexed by all this, as would anybody be. The players all played at once without waiting for turns, quarreling all the while and fighting for the hedgehogs. And in a very short time, the queen was in a furious passion and went stabbing about and shouting, Off with this head, or off with her head, about once in a minute. Alice began to feel very uneasy, to be sure. She had not as yet had any dispute with the queen, but she knew that it might happen at any minute. And then, thought she, what would become of me? They're dreadfully fond of petting people here. The great wonder is that there's anyone left alive. She was looking about for some way of escape and wondering whether she could get away without being seen when she noticed a curious appearance in the air. It puzzled her very much at first, but after watching it a minute or two, she made it out to be a grin, and she said to herself, Excuse me. It's the Cheshire Cat. Now I shall have somebody to talk to. How are you getting on? said the cat as soon as there was a mouth enough for it to speak with. Alice waited till the eyes appeared and then nodded. It's no use speaking to it, she thought, till its ears have come, or at least one of them. Oh, excuse me, my apologies, y'all. In another minute, the whole head appeared, and then Alice put down her flamingo and began an account of the game. Feeling very glad she had someone to listen to, her, the cat seemed to think that there was enough of it now in sight and no more of it appeared. I don't think they play at all fair. Alice began in a rather complaining tone, and they all quarrel so dreadfully one can't hear oneself speak, and they don't seem to have any rules in particular, at least if there are, nobody attends to them, and if you've no idea how confusing it is all the things being alive. For instance, there's the arch I've got to go through next, walking about at the other end of the ground, and I should have croqueted the queen's hedgehog just now, only it ran away when it saw mine coming. How do you like the queen? said the cat in a low voice. Not at all, said Alice. She's so extremely... Just then she noticed that the queen was close behind her, listening so she went on likely to win that it's hardly worth while finishing the game the queen smiled and passed on uh, uh, who are you talking to said the king coming up to alice and looking at the cat's head with great curiosity it's a friend of mine a cheshire cat said alice allow me to introduce it i don't like the look of it at all, said the king. However, it may kiss my hand if it likes. I'd rather not, the cat remarked. Don't be impertinent, said the king, and don't look at me like that. He got behind Alice as he spoke. A cat may look at a king, said Alice. I've read that in some book, but I don't remember where. Well, it must be removed, said the king very decidedly, and he came to the queen, who was passing at the moment, my dear, I wish you would have this cat removed. The queen had only one way of settling all her difficulties, great or small. Off with this head, she said without even looking around. I'll fix the executioner myself, said the king eagerly, and he hurried off. Alice thought she might as well go back and see how the game was going, so as she heard the queen's voice in the distance screaming with passion, she already heard her sentence three of the players to be executed for having missed their turns, and she did not like the look of things at all, as the game was in such confusion that she never knew whether it was her turn or not. So she went off in search of her hedgehog. 
The hedgehog was engaged in a fight with another hedgehog, which seemed to Alice an excellent opportunity for croqueting one of them with the other. The other difficulty was that her flamingo was gone across to the other side of the garden, where Alice could see it trying in a helpless sort of way to fly up into a tree. By the time she had caught the flamingo and brought it back, the fight was over and both the hedgehogs were out of sight. But it doesn't matter, thought Alice, as all the arches are gone from this side of the ground. So she tucked it away under her arm, that it might not escape again, and went back to have a little more conversation with her friend. When she got back to the Cheshire Cat, she was surprised to find quite a large crowd collected round it. There was a dispute going on between the executioner, the king, and the queen, who were all talking at once, while all the rest were quite silent and looked very uncomfortable. The moment Alice appeared, she was appealed to by all three to settle the question, and they repeated their arguments to her, though as they all spoke at once, she found it a very hard to make out exactly what they said. The executioner's argument was that you couldn't cut off a head unless there was a body to cut it off from, that he had never had to do such a thing before he wasn't going to begin at his time of life. The king's argument was that anything that had a head could be beheaded, and that you weren't to talk nonsense. The queen's argument was that if something wasn't done about it in less than no time, she'd have everybody executed all around. <laughs> yes. The absurdity is real in this moment. This poor executioner, he's just like, you can't behead something that ha doesn't have a neck. It was this last remark that made the whole party look so grave and anxious. Alice could think of nothing else to say, but it belongs to the Duchess. You better ask her about it. She's in prison, the Queen said to the executioner. Fetch her here! And the executioner went off like an arrow. The cat's head began fading away the moment he was gone, and by the time he had come back with the Duchess, it had entirely disappeared. So the King and the executioner wild ran wildly up and down looking for it while the rest of the party went back to the gang. Chapter 9. The Mock Turtle Story. You can think how glad I am to see you again, you dear old thing, said the Duchess as she tucked her arm affectionately into Alice's, and they walked off together. Alice was very glad to find her in such a pleasant temper and thought to herself that perhaps it was only the pepper that had made her so savage when they met in the kitchen. When I'm Duchess, she said to herself, not in a very hopeful tone, though, I won't have any pepper in my kitchen at all. Soup does very well without. Maybe it's always pepper that makes people hot-tempered, which is not true. Pepper is awesome. She went on, very much pleased at having found out a new kind of rule, and vinegar that makes them sour, and chamomile that makes them bitter, and, and barley sugar, and such things that make children sweet-tempered. I only wish people knew that. Then they wouldn't be so stingy about it, you know. She had quite forgotten the Duchess by this time. It was a little startled when she heard her voice close to her ear. You're thinking about something, my dear, and that makes you forget to talk. I can't tell you just now what the moral of that is, but I shall remember it in a bit. Perhaps it hasn't one, Alice ventured to remark. Tut, tut, child, said the Duchess. Everything's got a moral, if only you could find it. And she squeezed herself up closer to Alice's side as she spoke. Alice did not much like her keeping so close to her. First, because the Duchess was very ugly, and secondly, because she was exactly the right height to rest her chin on Alice's shoulder, and it was an uncomfortable sharp chin. However, she did not like to be rude, so she bore it as well as she could. The game's going on rather better now, she said, by way of keeping up the conversation a little. And no, it's not cool to call somebody ugly. She's just she's just a handsome woman. Just a very, very big-headed lady. <laughs> tis so, said the Duchess, and the moral of that is, oh, tis love, tis love that makes the world go round. Somebody said, Alice whispered, that it's done by everybody minding their own business. Ah, well, it means much the same thing, said the Duchess, digging her sharp little chin into Alice's shoulder as she added, and the moral of that is 
take care of the scents and the sounds will take care of themselves. How fond she is of finding morals in things, Alice thought to herself. I dare say you're wondering why I don't put my arm round your waist, said the Duchess after a pause. The reason is that I'm doubtful about the temper of your flamingo. Shall I try the experiment? He might bite, Alice cautiously replied, not feeling at all anxious to have the experiment tried. Very true, said the Duchess. Flamingos and mustard both bite. And the moral of that is, birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> Only mustard isn't a bird, Alice remarked. Right as usual, said the Duchess. What a clear way you have of putting things. It's a mineral, I think, said Alice. Of course it is, said the Duchess, who seemed ready to agree to everything that Alice said. There's a large mustard mine near here, and the moral of that is, the more there is of mine, the less there is of yours. Oh, I know, exclaimed Alice, who had not attended to this last remark. It's a vegetable. It doesn't look like one, but it is. I quite agree with you, said the Duchess, and the moral of that is, be what you would seem to be, or if you like it... Put it more simply, never imagine yourself not to be otherwise than what it might appear to others that what you were or might have been was not otherwise than what you had been would have appeared to them to be otherwise. Say that three times fast. I think I should understand that better, Alice said very politely, if I had it written down, but I can't quite follow it as you say it. There's nothing to what I could say if I chose, the Duchess replied in a pleased tone. Pray, don't trouble yourself to say it any longer than that, said Alice. Oh, don't talk about trouble, said the Duchess. I make you a present of everything I've said as yet. A cheap sort of present, thought Alice. I'm glad they don't give birthday presents like that. But she did not venture to say it aloud. Thinking again, the Duchess asked with another dig of her sharp little chin. I've got a right to think, said Alice sharply, for she was beginning to feel a little worried. Just about as much right, said the Duchess, as pigs have to fly, and the mo But here, to Alice's great surprise, the Duchess's voice died away, even in the middle of her favorite word, moral, and the arm that was linked into hers began to tremble. Alice looked up, and there stood the Queen in front of them with her arms folded, frowning like a thunderstorm. A uh, fine day, Your Majesty! The Duchess began in a low, weak voice. Oh, now I give you fair warning, shouted the Queen, stamping on the ground as she spoke. Either you or your head must be off, and that in about half no time. Take your choice. The Duchess took her choice and was gone in a moment. Let's uh, go on with the game, the queen said to Alice, and Alice was too much frightened to say a word, but slowly followed her back to the croquet ground. The other guests had taken advantage of the queen's absence and were resting in the shade. However, the moment they saw her, they hurried back to the game, the queen merely remarking that a moment's delay would cost them their lives. All the time they were playing, the queen never left off quarreling with the other players and shouting, OFF with his head, or OFF with her head. Those whom she sentenced were taken into custody by the soldiers, who of course had to leave off being arches to do this, so that by the end of half an hour or so there were no arches left, and all the players, except the king, the queen, and Alice, were in custody and under sentence of execution. Then the queen left off, quite out of breath, and said to Alice, Have you seen the mock turtle yet? No, said Alice, I don't even know what a mock turtle is. It's the thing mock turtle soup is made from, said the queen. I never saw one or heard of one, said Alice. Come on then, said the queen, and he shall tell you his history. As they walked off together, Alice heard the king say in a low voice to the company generally, You are all pardoned. Come, that's a good thing, she said to herself, for she had felt quite unhappy at the number of executions the queen had ordered. They very soon came upon a griffin lying fast asleep in the sun. If you don't know what a griffin is, look at the picture. Which a griffin is a very famous mythological creature, has the body of a lion, 
and the upper part of an eagle. It's like half an eagle, half a lion. It's actually one of my favorite mythological creatures. Besides, besides a hippogriff, of course, which has the body of a horse and the body of a bird. It's actually really cool. Up, lazy thing, said the queen, and take this young lady to see the mock turtle and to hear his history. I must go back and see after some executions I have ordered. And she walked off, leaving Alice alone with the griffin. Alice did not quite the look of the cre did not quite like the look of the creature, but on the whole, she thought it would be quite as safe to stay with it as long as it to go after that savage queen. So she waited. The griffin sat up, rubbed its eyes, then it watched the queen till she was out of sight, and then it chuckled. <laughs> <laughs> what fun, said the griffin, half to itself, half to Alice. What is the fun, said Alice. Why, she, said the griffin, it's all her fancy that they never execute nobody, you know. Come on. Everybody says come on here, thought Alice as she went on slowly after it. I never was so ordered about before in all my life, never. They had not gone far before they saw the mock turtle in the distance, sitting sad and lonely on a little edge of rock. As they came nearer, Alice could hear him sighing as if his heart would break. She pitied him deeply. What is his sorrow? she asked the griffin, and the griffin answered very nearly in the same words as before. It's all his fancy, that. He hasn't got no sorrow, you know. Come on! So they went up to the mock turtle, who looked at them with large eyes full of tears, but said nothing. This here young lady, said the griffin, she wants for to know your history, she do. I'll tell it to her, said the mock turtle in a deep hollow tone. Sit down, both of you, and don't speak a word till I've finished. So they sat down, and nobody spoke for some minutes. Alice thought to herself, I don't see how he can ever finish if he doesn't begin. But she waited patiently. Once, said the mock turtle at last with a deep sigh, I was a real turtle. These words were followed by a very long silence, broken only by an occasional exclamation of ha! from the griffin and the constant heavy sobbing of the mock turtle. <laughs> Alice was very nearly getting up and saying, Thank you, sir, for your interesting story. But she could not help thinking there must be more to come. So she sat still and said nothing. So there's the mock turtle, Griffin, and Alice, all attending to the story. Pleasantly by the sea. When we were little, the mock turtle went on at last more calmly, though still sobbing a little now and then. We went to school in the sea. The master was an old turtle who used to call him tortoise why did you call him tortoise if he wasn't one alice asked we call him tortoise because he thought us said the mock turtle angrily really you are very dull you ought to be ashamed of yourself for asking such a simple question added the griffin and then they both sat silent and looked at poor alice who felt ready to sink into the earth at last the griffin said to the mock turtle Drive on, old fellow. Don't be all day about it. And he went on in these words. Yes, we went to school in the sea, though you mayn't believe it. I never said I didn't, interrupted Alice. You did, said the mock turtle. Hold your tongue, added the griffin before Alice could speak again. The mock turtle went on. We had the best of educations. In fact, we went to school every day. I've been to a day school, too, said Alice. You needn't be so proud as all that. With extras? asked the mock turtle a little anxiously. Yes, said Alice. We learned French and music. And washing? said the mock turtle. Certainly not, said Alice indignantly. Ah, oh, then yours wasn't a really good school, said the mock turtle in a tone of great relief. Now at ours, they had at the end of the bill French, music, and washing. Extra. You couldn't have wanted it much, said Alice, living at the bottom of the sea. I couldn't afford to learn it, said the mock turtle with a sigh. I only took the regular course. What was that? inquired Alice. 
Reeling and writhing, of course, to begin with, the Mock Turtle replied, and then the different branches of arithmetic, ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. I've never heard of uglification, Alice ventured to say. What is it? The Griffin lifted up both its paws in surprise. Never heard of uglification, it exclaimed. You know what to beautify is, I suppose. Alice said doubtfully, it means to make anything prettier. Well then, the griffin went on, if you don't know what to unglify is, you are a simpleton. Alice did not feel very encouraged to ask any more questions about it, so she turned to the mock turtle and said, what else had you to learn? Well, there was mystery, the mock turtle replied, counting off the subjects on his flappers. Mystery, ancient and modern, with seaography, the drawling. The drawling master was an old conger eel that used to come once a week. He taught us drawling, stretching and fainting in coils. What was that like? said Alice. Well, I can show it to you myself. The Mock Turtle said, I'm too stiff, and the Griffin never learned it. Had time, said the Griffin. I went to the classical master, though. He was an old crab, he was. I never went to him, the Mock Turtle said with a sigh. He taught laughing and grief, they used to say. So he did, so he did, said the Griffin, sighing in his turn. And both creatures hid their faces in their paws. And how many hours a day did you do lessons, said Alice in a hurry to change the subject. Ten hours the first day, said the Mock Turtle, nine the next, and so on. What a curious plan, exclaimed Alice. That's the reason they're called lessons, the Griffin remarked. Because they lessened from day to day. This was quite a new idea to Alice, and she remarked that over a little before she made her next remark, then the eleventh day must have been a holiday. Of course it was, said the Mock Turtle. And how did you manage on the twelfth? Alice went on eagerly. That's enough about lessons, the Griffin interrupted in a very decided tone. Tell her something about the games now. And that, dear friends, is where we will end for tonight. I'm telling you, this story is bonkers, and I love it. I love it. I live for it. Well, I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you get to enjoy this lovely Friday, and I'll see you all next time. And y'all, always remember, kindness and compassion should never be a foreign concept. You don't have to know somebody to show them kindness. You don't have to know somebody to love on them and be genuine with them and even people who are mean to you always be better than what they perceive you to be see you next time